right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to SDL History Live, Impressions of Missouri, 1810 to 1830. My name is Aaron Pelker. I'm a community engagement coordinator with the Missouri History Museum's Public History Department. And I wanna thank you for spending part of your Tuesday morning with us. Before we get to our presentation, I do have a couple of brief remarks. I wanna mention that both the Missouri History Museum in Forest Park and the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum downtown are both open to the public from Wednesday through Sunday. Your safety is a top priority and we would love for you to visit if you feel comfortable doing so. Advanced free reservations are required to visit both locations, but please visit momohistory.org to plan your visit and reserve your free tickets. Next, I wanna mention that today's program is part of the ongoing statewide initiative to honor our state's Missouri's bicentennial, commemorating 200 years of history. In a little bit, I'll share a, a statewide calendar of events commemorating the bicentennial. So please look for that in the Zoom chat. Also, I do wanna thank our museum members and the Zoom Museum Tax District for their generous support for both our exhibits and our programming. We wouldn't be able to host programs like this morning without their contributions. Lastly, before I turn it over to our presenters for this morning's program, I do wanna explain a few of the features you'll find on Zoom that may be helpful this morning. First, this will be about a 30 to 40 minute presentation with some time at the end for audience Q&A. You can submit your questions at any time for our speaker through the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. We're also happy to offer closed captioning through Zoom. To enable closed captioning, simply click the CC button on your Zoom toolbar. And finally, at the conclusion of the program, we hope you'll complete a short survey that will automatically open in your internet browser. Uh, we appreciate and look forward to your feedback. With that, I'd like to turn it over and introduce our speakers this morning, Missouri Historical Society Librarian, Emily J. Cox, and Jamie Barassa, Associate Archivist at the Missouri Historical Society. So thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Aaron. Um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, the Missouri Historical Society is engaging in a series of activities to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Missouri becoming a state. And our director, Dr. Francis Levine, suggested a program drawing on letters and diaries from our collection from that era. Uh, Jamie and I thought that sounded interesting to work on. So here we are to share some of our findings with you this morning. Next slide, please. We want to acknowledge that some of the language used in historical documents can be disturbing to us today. Uh, sharing their words does not mean that we share their opinions. We have preserved the original language of the sources. Next slide, thank you. This is a map showing Missouri's boundaries at the time of statehood. Um, if you look at the shape of the state of Missouri, it doesn't look quite like what we expect it to look. Um, that's because the northwest corner of the state, the little tip that now extends a little bit west from there, that area is known as the Platte Purchase, and that did not occur until later in 1837. Next slide, please. Zooming into this map, you can see that the main features highlighted on this map are rivers, uh, and their tributaries. And this is uh, largely because at the time, rivers were still the primary form of transportation. They were the main way that uh, long distance transportation could occur most conveniently. You can also see some uh, mountain ranges and you can see a few towns. The original French and Spanish colonial settlers mostly you, uh, settled on both sides of the Mississippi River, which you can see that yellow red boundary over there. And then you can see St. Louis up at the confluence with St. Charles just a little bit past it. That was pretty much the extent of the colonial network. But as um, after 1904, when Missouri became part of the United States through the Louisiana Purchase, um, Americans pouring into the region were start 
starting to push westward. So you'll see the little settlement of Franklin and a few others, but the population centers for the American, the newly Americanized Missouri were still mainly along the Mississippi River and somewhat on the Missouri River. Next slide, please. So a visitor coming to St. Louis specifically around the time of statehood, uh, what would they have seen when they visited? Next. This is zooming into the uh, earlier slide. This is an image from uh, a banknote um, issued in 1817. This is the earliest known view of St. Louis. And you can see that the boat in the foreground is not a steamboat. Um, this was engraved months before the steamboat Zebulon Pike arrived at St. Louis, making it a much bigger port and um, drawing floods and floods of new visitors and residents into the area. So if you look at this a little bit, you can see uh, houses ranging from buildings ranging from one to three stories kind of um, some of them are clustered together, but there's still quite a bit of open space between many of them. And the buildings kind of heading up the hill and you see that little tower at the top. That was uh, the remains of a former fortified tower from the colonial era. Next slide, please. This is a map showing St. Louis, the town plan in 1822, which was the year after statehood and the year that St. Louis became incorporated as a town. The, you'll notice that this map has north at the, at the right, instead of we're used to seeing north at the top, but a lot of historic maps of St. Louis will show the Mississippi River at the bottom, like this one. The darker area that you see um, closer to the river represents the earlier uh, layout of the village, the original village of St. Louis. And you can see the remnants of a prior, the prior city fortification. That would today be, uh, if you went to the arch grounds, you'd basically be standing at, on the grass underneath the arch and you'd be matching up with that area. On this map, you can also see that the city had grown since colonial times and was spreading out west towards Shoto's Pond. Um, this map has a typo in it. So where it says um, Fifth Street, just at the border between the old and new towns, that's actually should be Fourth Street. Next slide, please. So this town has legends, include, including the major features of the town. And you can see um, in St. Louis's early days, the only church was uh, the Catholic church. But by the time St. Louis was incorporated, uh, some Protestant denominations had established in St. Louis also. And uh, you can see there was a jail and then commerce and business are represented by the market a bank, a ferry, and two mills. And you can see that except for the ferry and the mills, the civic organization, civic institutions of St. Louis kind of form a spine going up the center of town, up the hill towards the old, you can see that little uh, building with the flag on top. That, that was the same little tower we saw in the previous image when we were kind of looking uphill from the riverbank. So many of the visitors whose voices you're going to hear in today's program, this would match up with what they, what they would have experienced on their first visit to St. Louis. Next slide, please. I'm going to share with you some impressions of St. Philippine Duchenne. She was not a saint at the time she was here, but um, she wrote voluminous letters to her mother superior in France and to other people to describe her experience in Missouri. Um, from a young age, Philippine Duchenne had dreamed of coming to North America and ministering to Native American children. That was um, a goal that she'd had for a long time. And when Bishop Dubourg came to St. Louis and identified needs in the town. One of the, he thought that uh, schooling was a need that was unmet and he started recruiting orders of nuns to come and help with education and priests and nuns. And um, so he sent for Philippine Duchenne and some of her co-religious 
And um, the idea when he sent for them is that she would be teaching in St. Louis itself. But between the time she got the call and the time she arrived in St. Louis, St. Louis had been growing so quickly that it turned out that she, it, she didn't end up teaching where she thought she would. Next slide. Um, with her strong interest in the Native American peoples, some of her letters did include descriptions. Whenever she saw them, she tried to write what she was able to learn from those encounters. She said, in St. Louis, a trading company has been established to regulate commerce between Missouri and the Indians beyond this territory. Now, here we come to a word that is not a word we would choose today, but where this English translation using the word savage, that's a translation of the French word for Indian, which is savage. As a result, the savages are more friendly with the white men and come down the river. We met quite a number who had come to confer with the representatives of the government of the United States. They followed us to the river, touched the hands of the sisters and gazed after us until we had attained this bank. One of the things that comes out in some of her other letters is that the many Native Americans had met uh, Jesuit priests in the past and were familiar with their black robes. So the sisters also wearing black habits were, um, that was a recognizable sight to the Native Americans and they felt that they could connect with the, with the sisters as religious because of their, uh, because of their habits. Next slide, please. Again, Philippine Duchenne never was afraid to complain if she didn't like something. And she spent a lot of time complaining to Bishop Dubourg because it took a long time for there actually to be Indian children in her school. She started out educating the children of mostly of, uh, St. Louisans of French ancestry, but also some Americans sent their daughters to her school. And um, she was very frustrated with this at first, but then when, when she uh, resigned herself to her situation and began teaching the students, she found out that with the ba most basic religious instruction was new to them. The children had never heard of our Lord, of his birth or his death, nor of hell, and listened agape to our instructions. When we complain that we have no savages, Monsieur Dubourg says, indeed you have, and your work among these will be more lasting and wider because of the influence of the rich over the poor. Next slide, please. So in this, uh, I referred to the difficulty of finding a location. Um, land prices were jumping so quickly that the funds that Bishop Dubourg was able to raise to support this were didn't go as far as he originally thought. So he established them in St. Charles, Missouri. Um, he moved them to Florissant. They moved back to St. Charles. They moved back to Florissant. They were in St. Louis for a brief time later on, but um, Philippine Duchenne's earliest school was established in St. Charles. There was an existing log cabin. He was able to find a, a supporter who would donate the cabin and its land to the sisters. The sisters had to, um, they were using the same dwelling for, uh, for the children. They had some boarding students, so they would have to instruct in the cabin and then rearrange all the furniture to put the beds in for the night. So there was a lot of effort. It was very rudimentary situation. And this is a watercolor of a view from St. Charles looking across the river. So even though unfortunately this view does not include uh, the town of St. Charles at the time, you can see that it was a very, um, a very natural undeveloped landscape that was uh, near Philippine Duchenne School. This is a picture I took on a tour of the Shrine of St. Ferdinand in Florissant. Um, if you ever get a chance to take this tour, I can't recommend it enough. This is a picture that was taken of a place setting um, in the room where the nuns and the girls had their meals together. 
And Philippine Duchenne, many of her letters uh, describe what kinds of how they made, how they got by with foodstuffs in that area. We look upon potatoes and cabbage as you in France do upon rare delicacies. There is no market. A pound of butter and a dozen eggs would be a fortune. And although we did not want to avail ourselves of the permission to eat meat on Saturdays, we have been obliged to do so. In the hunting season, one can procure deer and geese, but in spring and summer, one can get only salt fish and meat. Our cow only supplies enough milk for our three pupils and for Mother Octavi who presides over their meal. The well in our garden is dried up and it costs 12 cents every time we send someone down to the Missouri to get us two little buckets of water. So this slide shows an image uh, that I showed you before in the upper right hand corner. That's uh, St. Louis, the village in 1817, just before the steamboat era really took hold. And then in the lower left corner, you see an image that's from an engraving from 1838. So about 20 years later. So these are sort of two bookend images of St. Louis around the time of steamboat uh, statehood. And you can see on the left that Bishop Dubourg uh, finally got his church built. There's the spire of the old cathedral. But before that happened, he was using a log cabin and trying to make it work. And there was a brick building that was constructed in between the log, the original log cabin and the structure that we know today. And Philippine Duchenne wrote that the Bishop's palace is like a tiny French barn and he is trying to replace his old cathedral of wood and in holes by a new one for which he is collecting from people already overtaxed. So though she was impatient with the progress of things in her school, she was quick to acknowledge that Bishop Durburg was not, you know, hoarding wealth for himself. He was struggling just as much to establish all the different organizations that he thought that the St. Louis needed um, for its relig religious and educational observances. Thank you. All right, thanks, Emily. I'm gonna take over now um, and share a few additional accounts of both St. Louis. Um, the first two are from 1821 and about St. Louis. And then the third one is from 1823 and about Callaway County, Missouri. Uh, first up, we have the impressions of an unidentified gentleman um, writing to a friend of his back in Salem, Massachusetts, where presumably he came from um, in early 1821. And this letter was also published in the Lynchburg Press in Virginia later that year in 1821. And I'll speak in a moment about possibly why this particular letter was printed. Um, our gentleman gives really great descriptions of St. Louis, of the people, the buildings, um, but he doesn't paint it in all that favorable of a light. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so I pulled a few passages. Uh, the first one is about emigration. The emigration to the state has stopped and many have actually gone back after being disappointed in the quality of the lands, which have been falsely cried up to be the richest in the world. People cannot live on them without being subject to bilious fever, dysentery, ague, and other complaints the greater part of the year. And this is referring to St. Louis's reputation at the time as being an unhealthy place to live, which um, it probably wasn't any more unhealthy than any other city at the time. Um, oops. The area was settled as early as 1764, contains only 4,000 inhabitants, and now decreasing. They are of a mixed assemblage. The original French are from Canada, some of them white, and the different shades from that color to Indian or black. A few of the white females are handsome, excessively fond of dress in a variety of gaudy colors, attending church and dancing. There are Tennesseans, Kentuckians, Virginians, Pennsylvanians, and some few Yankees, whom the people of the West have a strange opinion of. But the greater population are Irish who concentrate here on account of a Catholic church and bishop. The people from each state and country, generally speaking, plan together without much intermixture. The ancient buildings are of logs and of stone, 
as ugly, inconvenient, and rough as possible, constructed after the manner of the French, with lots for gardens appurtenant, mostly on the first bank, which is a bed of limestone. The streets are narrow and dirty, either half leg deep or more, or enveloped in dust. The roads, three months past, have been in the worst condition, the mud being at times 14 inches deep. Some new houses built, which are mostly of brick, including a jail of stone, but without any display of architectural taste or skill in their construction. There is a large pond of stagnant water, two miles in length, which in the latter part of the summer sends forth a disagreeable smell and produces myriads of mosquitoes. And uh, this pond he's referring to here was Shoto's Pond, um, named after Auguste Shoto and located on his land. And it was an important part of recreation for the city in early St. Louis. People would go there to boat and fish and have picnics on the banks. Um, and they would also perform baptisms in the water. Uh, the image at the top is from a little later in time from the 1840s. And the lake didn't exist much beyond that. It was drained after the 1849 cholera epidemic. And then he touches a bit on the economy. Business is in a deplorable state. High rents, dear living, enormous taxes, little business, and small profits make it a losing concern. The country is overrun with all kinds of goods, which the holders are trying to sacrifice at auction, but with difficulty find a few cash purchasers. The place is drained of round specie, uh, meaning coins. Sheriff's sales are getting very frequent and real property will not command one quarter of what it was formerly valued at. Among other things, the sheriff took possession of the Exchange Bank, an Irish concern, nine days since. The Missouri Bank at St. Louis and its branch at St. Genevieve continues good and pays specie. And then about the weather, he wrote, last summer, the thermometer was no higher than 98 degrees in the shade, but this warmth of the climate, together with the continued showers of dust, which are frequent during the warm season, was extremely debilitating. It was a hard matter to sit, keep awake during the day or from the troublesome bugs, fleas, cockroaches, and mosquitoes to sleep at night. And knowing St. Louis summers, I can't imagine what it would be like to live back before air conditioning. <laughs> Must have been tough. Um, I particularly like this passage where he writes about health and medical care. There were many deaths between July and November, particularly particularly among the low Irish who would fill themselves with whiskey and sleep in the open air. The mode of treatment for bilious fevers was different from that in any warm climate I ever was in. They bleed freely. Um, and he's referring to the process, the um, process of bloodletting where people would um, take blood from people from small cuts or leeches as a way to reduce fevers. And we know now that's not the best thing to do, but back then it was um, a way to deal with many diseases. Um, they bleed freely and afterwards give emetics and other strong doses of calomel and jalap. They first reduced the patient so much they had not strength to encounter the second and third bleeding. And of course, too many fell victim to the strange mode of practice. I was known to a person's being bled 18 times in a bilious fever. He was a man of regular habits and an iron constitution. His fever was subdued, but he died at the end of nine weeks after the attack. Another person of my acquaintance was bled 27 times in a pleurisy and died 10 days after the attack without pain. And then he goes into a section about um, entertainment in the city. The amusements are balls, white, yellow, and black, and which are frequent and well attended. Billiards are fashionable, raffling very common, card playing universal. 500 packs of cards are sold to one Bible. There are here what is called king balls, for it is a hard matter even for the rustic Democrats of the West to forsake and expunge the tinsel epithets of royalty. The first ball of the season is by subscription, early after the cold weather commences. And at this ball, some ladies, say four or six, and generally the handsomest in the company, select as many gentlemen as kings, which is performed by a lady's pinning a bouquet to a gentleman's bosom and giving him a kiss. The next ball he calls on his queen and inquires what she most fancies to adorn her person, which he procures for her, generally a complete set of fineries. 
and each time he calls on her, gets a fresh kiss. When the queens are all adorned, um, and here he's referring about they, they get presents like jewelry and hats and dresses. Uh, when the queens are all adorned, a ball is given by the kings who wait on and dance with their queens. They are then, after taking the parting kiss, all reduced to commoners, and the ex-queens, or other ladies, kiss and crown other gentlemen as kings. Several ladies, the last winter, got in this way sufficient apparel to last them the whole year. And then this published letter ends with an editor's note, which I find pretty interesting. It reads, we request the attention of our readers to the letter from St. Louis. It gives a dismal picture of the situation of Missouri. It ought at least to have the effect of making men more cautious in yielding to the seductions of their imagination and in exchanging the plenty, tranquility, and good society of their native state for a country of which they know nothing, whose advantages of climate, soil, and commerce have been much exaggerated, and whose general society is made up of materials too heterogeneous and rude to be very enlightened or very agreeable. And I think uh, this really points to a real fear in the East of um, losing their young population to the West as they go out to seek their fortunes on the frontier. And um, that potentially would have a negative effect on their economy if they lost too many of their workforce. Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting. It's like a bit of propaganda printing this letter in their paper. All right, next I have um, some excerpts from a series of letters from William Carlane to his wife, Mary. Uh, William Carlane was a doctor who came to St. Louis in 1819. Um, he was actually elected the first mayor of St. Louis a couple years later in 1823. But at the time, um, he was in St. Louis working on getting a household set up for himself and his wife. Um, his wife was pregnant at the time and living in Indiana with her family. And he writes about the difficulties of getting people to work on his house and also um, procuring lumber and other things needed to build a house. On January 12th, 1821, he wrote, the house is but little advanced since my last report. The weather has been extremely adverse. Both the men have been sick and until yesterday, I was unable to procure some lumber that was wanted. A few days later on January 17th, he wrote, it seems as if a new link bound me to the soil upon which I now am. Our house grows slowly. The weather is so dismally cold that the men who you know are masters of their own time will not work the one fourth of their time. The pecuniary aspect of the times are awful. The gloom increases daily. God preserved the land from total ruin, but I can see no help for those who are in much debt because their property will not command anything. And then I included this part because it's cute and it's about a dog. Tell cousin George his dog, Teague O'Curley, which is also a fantastic name for a dog, is growing up in ignorance. He committed so many malefactions amongst others, always doing the counterpart of eating and drinking most unceremoniously under our noses that we at length boarded him over at the generals. I wish Ewing would allow me to give him away. He is not a promising puppy. On February 8th, he wrote, I will certainly be present to welcome the coming of my boy, but I will not come until just about the time. And I included this picture because indeed he did not have a boy. His daughter, Sarah, was born, and this is her pictured. Our home will not be near done before I set out. This is unavoidable, and I assure you, no blame is attachable to me on that account. The weather has been so very bad, sometimes too cold, sometimes too hot, the men sometimes sick, impossibility to get lumber now. The painter says the weather is too bad to paint and glaze. Each of these things caused some delay. And then February 16, he wrote, in things generally, I am a fortunate man, but in the article of horses, I am uniformly unlucky. For instance, just when I most need the services of Mr. Black, what should he do but run and caper and run and snap in his knee just about the joint? He is now quite lame and whether he will be able to carry me across or not is quite uncertain. Um, so I am going to assume that he was able to go be with his wife in time for the birth of his daughter, because this is the last letter we have from him to Mary for quite some time. Um, but it does show the difficulty of transportation of the time. And if your, your horse um, is injured, it's like having to put your, um, your car in the auto shop. And then finally, I have um, some excerpts from a letter from married couple Clorinda and James Tate. 
writing from Callaway County to their brother back out east in 1823. And I like this account because it tells about um, starting out completely new um, on the frontier. Uh, Clorinda wrote most of the letter and she started out, I am now seated on the land I may call my own and our family in good health. We are now camped in the woods near the prairie. There is water in abundance, quite convenient, which is very good now, though I don't expect it runs all season. James and I were looking out a situation yesterday for our cabin. I thought it hard to determine which was the best as there is so much sameness in the prairie. We concluded to build on a rise in the prairie, not very far from a spring, though I am afraid it will disappear in a dry season. James and William Pouchiman, the young man who was engaged to live with us two years, is now cutting house logs and they will soon be ready to raise a cabin. Our neighbors have been to see us. They all appear very genteel and extremely kind. They have all made us presents of venison, turnips and potatoes. We have not had such things since we came here. Judge Grant came to see us yesterday. He gave me a friendly invitation to go with him and stay until our house would be ready. He lives four miles from this. He sent two black boys today to cut prairie grass for us. He says it is in fine order now for hay and very good for horses. He proposed coming and bringing some of his neighbors to assist in raising and covering our cabin. We expect to raise in a few days. It has been quite healthy in this country this season. Some few have the fever and ague, but light turns of it. I think if you were to visit this country, you would be pleased with it. I think if it was settled and cultivated, it would be the handsomest country I have ever seen. The prairies are beautiful beyond description. They are from spring to late in the fall, constantly in bloom with a great variety of blooms and thickly set with grass as a meadow. There is a constant breeze passing even in the sultry days of summer. I think it is calculated to be the healthiest place in the world if the water is good and those that have dug have got fine water. And then her husband, James added a little note at the end of the letter. He said, we are now living in a tent in a little grove of timber, waking up in the edge of a beautiful little prairie, part of which town surrounded by a great number of wolves, bears, deer, and turkeys, and a good number of very friendly neighbors and I expect to raise a cabin on next Tuesday. Oh, could I offer you anything as an encouragement that might induce you to move or even come to see our country, I would. And I don't know if the brother actually ended up coming, um, but many others did come to, to settle in Missouri. And um, Emily and I, and I are planning a part two to this in um, later in the year, which will cover the next couple decades, the 30s and 40s. And um, we should have a um, more diverse pool of sources to pull from at that time as well. And uh, with that, we're happy to take any questions. Uh, I just wanna mention that our library is currently closed to the public, but we can still be reached for remote research. Uh, the best way to contact us is these two emails, library at mohistory.org and archives at mohistory.org. Um, uh, our staff are modern, monitoring the emails and we'll be happy to get back to you with the questions. All right, thanks for that, Emily and Jamie. It looks like we have one question uh, so far from an attendee. He asks, can you share the source of the map of Missouri at statehood? Yes, that's on our online collection search. Um, and I will try to uh, drop the link into the chat. Let me see if I can do that. This could take me a few minutes. So if somebody else has a question or if Jamie you wanna um, chat a little bit. Uh, this is going to be a few clicks before I get to it, but I, it shouldn't be too hard. It's yeah, probably a good time to mention that we do have a lot of our, um, a lot of things available on our website to view digitally. Um, if you go to collections.mohistory.org, um, you should be able to search our historic documents and we have a lot of photographs up there as well as uh, photographs of our object collections. So it's a good place to browse or if you're looking for something specific. But also be aware it's not nearly the entirety of our collections, just a small sample of right. what we have digitized. Um, we had one, one other question come in. Uh, Amanda Doyle asks, 
Are there newspaper or handbill advertisements in the collection that you came across that might have extolled the, quote, exaggerated, unquote, virtues of Missouri that potential settlers would have been exposed to, the inducements Lynchburg was worried about? Um, not that I remember seeing. Emily, have you? Advertisements? Hmm. Hang on, I found the link. So let me get that in the chat. Here comes. This should be a link to the map I showed. Okay. Um, when I sort of step back from the reading I've done so far about this time period, it just seems that one of the things that strikes me is just extreme volatility. Um, waves of people coming through, some people going back, a lot of speculation, a lot of um, financial booms and busts. Um, there was, it was just, it seemed like a really turbulent time. So um, I think anything is possible. If another, uh, let's see, a good source for looking at historic newspapers, um, the State Historical Society of Missouri and Columbia run something called the Missouri Digital Newspaper Project. And they've also been partnering with um, newspapers.com. So if you have a specific year in mind, you can search, pick a newspaper and pick that year and browse through issues. And there's a way you can do that through the State Historical Society without having a paid subscription to newspapers.com. Although the portal that you can do that with is not as, it's not as conveniently set up for keyword searching. If you want the full power of newspapers.com, you either need a personal su subscription or you need to be affiliated with a library that can get you a link. Um, but that would be the first place I would go to look for that information. Also, a lot of frontier newspaper uh, publishers, they would reprint a lot of news from other papers. A lot, that's really how they got all their news that wasn't local came from reading other newspapers and reprinting it. So sometimes you'll see things that are widely shared and other, other times uh, not so much. Okay, I, if there's any last questions, uh, feel free to submit those now. If not, um, I do want to thank uh, Emily and Jamie again. Oh, here's for that. a question. It says, oh. I noticed that the northwest part is called the Howard District. Oh, I do not know the answer to that. I know that Howard, the what we know of uh, Missouri's counties today, um, some of them changed boundaries many times and evolved over time. And there was a you know, Howard County, there still is a Howard County, but the early Howard County was much larger. And I believe that when Missouri was a state, there were um, there were areas that are larger than what we would consider a county, but they were, they were called districts. But I do not know the namesake. Um, sorry about that. Well. Any last questions? Submit those as I'm making my last remarks here, but I don't see any, but uh, Emily or Jamie, if you see them pop up, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I do wanna thank Emily and Jamie for their time again this morning. Uh, we have our regularly scheduled STL History Live programs on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m as well as Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chats on select Wednesdays at noon. You can see a couple of the upcoming programs on this slide on your screen. You can find links for all our upcoming programs at mohistory, mohistory.org, or on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. So please be sure to check out that lineup. And also please don't forget to fill out the survey and let us know what you thought about our program today. But thanks again, everyone, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.